welcome to Kingdom Honor The Course. I'm so excited you decided to join us for the next seven weeks as we go through these principles. We're going to go through this book right here, Kingdom Honor, 12 Keys to Serving Your Leaders and Unlocking Your Destiny. If you don't have this book, I want you to get it. You could download it for free at kingdomhonor.com. Also, you can listen to the audiobook for free. So just go to kingdomhonor.com. You can do that. I know it'll be a blessing to you. I love you. I honor you. I'm excited about this. And I know this course is going to revolutionize your heart as you serve in your church and in the ministry that you serve in. And my prayer is that as you continue this course, your eyes will be open to the truth and the power of honor. And what we're going to do this first session is we're going to lay a foundation for which the rest of the sessions are going to be built on. You know, we're going to talk about the 12 keys to serving your leaders with excellence in the upcoming sessions. But those will be the pillars on which this foundation is built. In this first foundation, we're going to talk about why the church and why honor. Why is it so important in your life and my life? So if you're taking notes, write this down. Right now is the time to bring honor back. Right now is the time to bring honor back. You and I, we need to, from this day forward, we need to make a decision. We're going to bring honor back, back into our families, back into our workplaces, back into our churches. What I love about this principle is that wherever you apply honor, you're going to see increase. Honor is a powerful principle that produces multiplied effectiveness in your life. Think about it. If you apply honor in your marriage, your marriage is going to go to another level. There's going to be a stronger unity and bond between each other. If you apply honor to your children by spending quality time with them, valuing them, and pouring into them, your children are going to grow up being men and women of God living on purpose because you honored them, because you valued them. If you apply honor at the workplace, you're going to experience job promotion, favor, uh, increase. Why? all because you honored your bosses, your supervisors, your managers. And at the very beginning, what I want to do is give you the definition for honor. So write this down. Honor, it comes from the Greek word teme, and it means to esteem or elevate and value. It's to hold in high regard something or someone. It's a valuing by which the price is fixed. And Strong's definition says this, esteem, especially of the highest degree. So when we honor the people that God has placed in our lives, when we honor our pastors, when we honor our ministry leaders, when we honor our coworkers, what happens is God gives us this grace. You know why he gives us this grace? Because we walked, we tapped into humility. Honor and humility, they go hand in hand. Wherever you see honor, you're gonna see humility. Wherever you see humility, you're gonna see honor. So who does God promote? The humble. And it says he gives grace to the humble. You need that grace to fulfill God's calling on your life. And it's key for us to understand, if we're going to bring honor back, it has to start with the church. Everything begins in the house of God. Do you realize that we are salt and we are light? That means we have influence. The brighter we shine, the less darkness there is, right? But when we lower our brightness, darkness prevails. So we need to influence our culture. We are called to influence our culture. And as Christians, we have a biblical mandate. If we're going to bring honor back, we have this biblical mandate in 1 Thessalonians 5.12 that says, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. We are to esteem them, we're to elevate them, we're to hold them in high regard. Now, the enemy, he wants to do everything he can to devalue the church. He wants us to disrespect our leaders. His whole goal is to tear down the church and church leaders. And this is why this mandate exists, because you and I, we need to honor them. We need to value them. What the enemy is trying to do, we need to come against that. And um, I want to give you some statistics here just so you can get an idea where ministry leaders are in these last days. Listen to this. 57% can't pay their bills. 54% of ministry leaders are overworked and 43% are overstressed. 
These statistics provide insight into the culture of the body of Christ right now and why they need our help. You know, sometimes we think, you know, our, our pastor and ministry, ministry leaders are Superman or Superwoman, but the reality is they go through hardships, they go through struggles, they go through spiritual attacks, and they need our help. They need our support. You know, I think of just here in California, the last three years, there were three ministry leaders that committed suicide in California. Now, you probably know of pastors or ministry leaders in your country, state, wherever you're, that have also done that. And some of the ones in California that, and I knew one of them personally, but some of them, they struggled with different things. Some, it was depression, others insecurity, and others, some were overstressed. And this is why our leaders, they need a strong team around them. And one of the biggest burdens that God has placed on my heart is to see the local church strengthened. And for that to happen, the leaders must be strengthened because we can't have any more leaders thrown in the towel. We can't have any more ministry leaders giving up on their calling. They need a strong team. They need you and I to come around them and support them. One of my favorite leadership lessons in the Old Testament is found in Exodus 18. And it's when Jethro gives advice to Moses. Moses was his son-in-law. And here Moses was trying to do it all by himself. Moses was trying to do all the task, all the work. He was trying to do all of it, manage all the, all the people of Israel. And look at what Jethro said to him in Exodus 18. He said, this is not good, Moses' father-in-law exclaimed. You're going to wear yourself out and the people too. This job is too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. Now, many ministry leaders, they start out like this. Many ministry, they try to do it all themselves. Um, they don't want to ask for help sometimes. Sometimes they just, they, they think they can just do it all. So they try to, and they struggle and they fail at this. But look at what Jethro says to him. Jethro said, select from all the people, some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Amen. The fear of the Lord is essential to anyone serving in ministry. He goes on to saying, appoint them as leaders. They will help you carry the load, making the task easier for you. If you're taking notes, write this down. Your job is to make your ministry leader's task easier, not harder. Now, having served my senior pastor for seven years, I have noticed that, that when I've served him with a spirit of honor, I, I've seen the blessing and benefit on, on his life and his ministry. Also, being a ministry leader myself, I can attest to Man, it has been so refreshing and a blessing to my life when I have strong ministry leaders come alongside me and help me fulfill the vision that God gave me. Night and day difference. And I want to tell you this, you can make a significant impact in your city and in your church by serving the leaders whom God has placed in your life. You know, I think of the story of Moses when Israel was in battle against the Amalekites. And remember, Moses was on the hill. And when he was holding up his arms and holding up the staff, Israel was winning. They were advancing in the battle, right? But as he began to lower them, as he began to drop them because he was exhausted because of fatigue, what happened? Israel started to lose the battle. You know what's interesting to me is Aaron and Ur, they recognized that their leader was struggling. They recognized their leader was having a difficult time. And you know what they did? They ran up on the hill and they held his arms up one on the right, one on the left. They held Moses' arms up. And you know what happened? Israel had the victory. They won the battle. You want to have victory in your city? Hold up your leader's arms. You want to prevail against darkness in your city? Hold up your leader's arms. Just as Aaron and her held up Moses', come alongside your leaders and be that strong support, that strong encouragement to them. This right here is kingdom honor. Kingdom honor. Kingdom honor. I want to break down these two words for you. Kingdom. You know, you've heard this word before um, several times in the New Testament. Repent for the kingdom is near, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Kingdom. The Greek word for kingdom is basilie. And here's the meaning. Royal power, kingship, dominion, and rule of Jesus. The kingdom of God is just that. It's a kingdom. There is rank, there is rule, and there is order. It is not like the United States. Okay, this is the country that I'm a part of. Can I tell you something? The kingdom of God is nothing like the United States. We have a king and his name is Jesus. Let me give you just a couple of scriptures just so you can see the authority he has. John 5 says, 
God has given the Son absolute authority to judge so that everyone will honor the Son. Colossians 1 says, He is also head of the body, the church. Colossians 2 says, He is the head over every ruler and authority. And you know, Revelation 17, He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. If you are a part of a kingdom, which you're listening to this, you are a part of this kingdom, we live under this order. We live under our leader, uh, our ultimate leader, the superior, Jesus. And we live under the mandates that he gives in scripture. So when we're told in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work, we do that because we're following the orders of our king. However, I do want to say this too. We're not called just to honor our ministry leaders. We're called to honor everyone. Kingdom honor is you and me honoring every single person, whether it's our boss at work, whether it's our pastor, whether it's our wife, whether it's our children, whether it's our friends, whether it's our enemies. Yes, we're called to honor everyone. First Peter 2 verse 17 says this, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Peter is saying that we're to esteem everyone, we're to elevate everyone, we're to hold everyone in the highest regard. And this may be shocking to you, but we're commanded to honor everybody. The the honor principle is 360 degrees. Don't ever forget that. Honor is to be our culture and our identity. I'm going to say that again. Honor is to be our culture and our identity. Now, here's the good news. As you start this journey of honor, honor is the path to fulfilling God's plan for your life. And I want to tell you, there's never been more of an urgent time for every believer across across the globe to step into their calling right now. Every single one of us, you listening right now, we need to, from this day forward, step. We need to serve like we have never served before. We need to honor like we have never honored before. Um, Do you realize God has placed unique gifts on the inside of you? And with a divine mandate from heaven, he has a specific purpose for you to accomplish on the earth. But you know the reality is? is far too many Christians are not accomplishing their God-given calling. They're living far below their potential. And I want to encourage you with this, that it's not how you started the race, but it's how you finished the race. Because some of you may feel like, man, I'm not in my calling. I'm not where I should be. I want to give you one of the best scriptures on the subject of honor in 2 Timothy chapter 2. This right here is one of the best promises. Look at this. It says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. This is one of the most remarkable promises in the Bible right here. If you cleanse yourself from dishonor, you will be a vessel of honor. Do you want to be a vessel of honor? Do you want to be set apart as holy? Do you want to be useful to your master? Do you want to be prepared for every good work? Here's the good news. The choice is 100% your choice. Here's the other good news. It's 100% God's will for you. Remember Jesus said this in John 15. He said, my father is glorified when you bear much fruit. So this is God's will for your life. Be encouraged by that. And, uh, and, and I, I just want to encourage you. Some of you may feel like you're delayed. You may feel like maybe you've um, made mistakes that are, you just feel are irreparable or you feel like you're not where you should be. Um, I want to give you the scripture right here, Psalm 71, verse 21. I want you to hold on to this. I want you to highlight this in your Bible. It says, you will restore me to even greater honor and comfort me once again. You will restore me to even greater honor. You know who said this? David. David had committed adultery. He killed an innocent man. And you know the story. He repented. After that season, David declared this promise over his life. He said, you will restore me to even greater honor. I want you to settle this in your heart now, that no matter what is in your past, God will restore you to greater honor. Let God be God in your life. This is what he does best. God restores, he heals, and he makes new. I'm going to say that again. God restores, he heals, and he makes new. Let him be God in your life. If you focus on becoming a vessel of honor, nothing and no one can stop you from fulfilling your calling. Amen. Now what I want to do is I want to talk about the impact 
of honor and the impact of dishonor. Many people don't realize the magnitude of honor and dishonor. So I want to give you just a couple of biblical examples, just so you can understand the massive effect it has in your life and in my life. The first one is found in Mark 6, and this probably nails it the best. It's when Jesus returns to his hometown. And it's amazing because he stands in the synagogue and he's preaching. And you know what's interesting? It says the people, they were amazed at his wisdom. They were astonished at his teaching. But you know what? It also says they were offended at him and they didn't believe him. And there's this verse here, Mark 6 verse 5, that is just one of the most mind-blowing verses. And it says this, it says, he, Jesus, could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Like what? I mean, can you I read that again? He could do no miracle there except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Why couldn't Jesus do miracles among them? Now, we know the Bible says that they were offended. We know it says they didn't believe in him. But you know what's interesting to me? Jesus didn't address their offense and he didn't address their unbelief. He made one statement to the crowd. And look what he said. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his family. What was the root issue here? Dishonor. Dishonor hindered them from receiving the miraculous in their life. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Dishonor shuts the door on miracles. Honor opens the door for miracles. Now, let me prove this to you in another scenario in Scripture, in 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, this is among husbands and wives, but take a look at this, 1 Peter chapter 3. You husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. Wow, I got news for you. If your prayers are hindered, you're not receiving miracles. You're not receiving answered prayer. You're not receiving breakthrough. What's the key in this scripture? Honor. What's the implication? When you honor people, you hear God's voice so much clearer. Do you struggle with hearing God's voice? Could be connected to a lack of honor in your life. And I wanted to share this with you, especially for those of you that are married couples. One of the best ways I have learned to hear from God over the years is when I pray this simple prayer. When I say, Lord, how can I honor my wife today? Do you know I hear from God the fastest about that over anything? I could be praying about financial decisions. I could be praying about a ministry endeavor. I can be praying about needing breakthrough in this area or all kind of family issues. I can be praying about all kinds of things. And sometimes it takes a while to I hear back from God on certain things, right? But when I pray, Lord, how can I honor my wife today? The answers come instantly. And I want to challenge you to do that, especially you, those that are married. It could be the Holy Spirit will give me an idea right away. You know, uh, send her this text message right now. Buy her this gift right now. You know, do the dishes, vacuum the house, whatever it is. I want you to try it and watch what God does as he begins to speak to you. And you know what? As you begin to honor your spouse more and you begin to hear his voice more clearly and seeing how God speaks to you, what will happen is you're going to learn to hear from God more clearly in all the other areas of your life. Let me give you another example in 1 Corinthians 11. This is a strong one here. How many know Paul had to deal with difficult issues in the church, specifically with the Corinthian church? Look at what he says in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, and he was not happy with them. He said, that is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. I remember when I read this, you know, a few years ago, I used to just think this was just talking about communion, just talking about the elements of communion, because this section, this chapter is about communion. But you know what? As I read the whole thing in context, it's not just talking about communion. It's talking about how they were treating each other. They were dishonoring each other. You know, Paul said this. He said, you guys do more harm than good when you guys meet. This is in the same chapter. He said, do you think I'm going to praise you? He said, I certainly will not praise you. He addresses their division. He addresses them humiliating the poor. He addresses their dishonor. It's crazy, the, the impact of dishonor. And it, it says this, this is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. And some Christians, they believe, well, I can just honor God, but I'm not going to honor my pastor. 
this is a dangerous mindset to have. I can honor God, but I don't need to honor other brothers and sisters. I can honor God, but not honor people at my workplace. It's a very dangerous mindset to have. And the consequence is, this is why many of them, the Corinthian church, was weak, sick, and some have even died. Notice the first one. He said they're weak. I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. An absence of honor equals an absence of strength. Dishonoring people will make you weak. I just gave you three examples of the negative impact of dishonor. Let me give you uh, real quickly one positive impact of honor. And it's found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 2 through 3. Look at this. This is incredible. It says, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment. Check this out with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will live a long life on the earth. Wow. Now, yes, we're called to honor our physical, our biological father and our biological mother. Honor them, love them, adore them, respect them. But you know what? In the New Testament, this also applies to your spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers. You remember Paul said this? He said, I became your father in Christ when I preached the good news to you. Remember Paul said, he said, I have spiritual sons. Timothy was one of his spiritual sons. Onesimus was one of his spiritual sons. So take this principle of honoring. I want to encourage you, honor your father, honor your mother, but also honor your spiritual father and your spiritual mother and watch what happens in your life. Things will go well for you and you will live a long life. Now what I want to do is we come toward the end of the session. I want to talk about the importance of church authority and the importance of the church. As you know, the church has been under attack for the last 2,000 years. But to be really honest with you, I feel like this last year, the church just went through a massive attack globally. Just we took a major blow. Right now, do you realize 50% of Christians have not returned back to church? 50%. And and those statistics are across the board at most churches. Um, What happened? A lot of people got used to staying at home. And uh, some of them were great people. Some of them, they served with us a year and a half ago, two years ago. But they're not in ministry anymore. They're not attending church anymore. And um, I don't know about you, but I have seen this a lot, and I'm seeing it more. How many of you guys ever heard people that say, well, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian? Have you heard that before? I've heard that a handful, a lot of times. And if I've heard that multiple times, and you've heard that, this lie is spreading all over rapidly, that I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Or you'll hear things like, I'm not for organized religion. Or, you know, I have my own relationship with God. Have you heard that? Have you ever noticed, though, these statements, they come from those who don't attend church, who are not under authority, who are not accountable to anyone? And what's weird about those statements that these these Christians make is that you never hear Paul, Timothy, James, Peter say anything remotely close to this. You look at the early church, and they were passionate about building and establishing the local church. I mean, they talk about the organization, the structure. They talk about appointing elders and uh, bishops and deacons and, and the qualifications. They talk about spiritual gifts, how they operate in the churches. They talk about receiving offerings. They talk about how to appoint leaders in different cities. I mean, on and on. They're all about building the local church. And some have this idea that church is just a social club, that it's just a Sunday hangout spot. But they've missed the reality that the body of Christ is a part of a kingdom. And so we have to realize two things. Church is not just a social club. Yeah, we get together and and we socialize, but it's so much more than that. The church is two things. Number one, the church is a family. The church is a family made up of brothers and sisters. We have spiritual fathers, we have spiritual mothers, and we're all under Father God, right? We're a family. Number two, the church is a kingdom, which means God has appointed leaders to govern and lead the church in cities all over the world. We're a kingdom family. That's what you and I are. Paul said this. Look at this in Ephesians chapter 4. He said, now these are the gifts Christ gave the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. That is the role of ministry leaders in your life right there, to equip you 
for the ministry and to build you up. Can you see why you need ministry leaders in your life? Can you see how valuable they are? That's their job. They're going to equip you. They're going to build you up. They're going to cultivate God's gifting and calling on your life. And like I mentioned earlier, you have spiritual gifts on the inside of you. Romans 12 said, listen, to this is in his grace. God has given us. He's given you gifts for doing certain things well. And that gifting on your life is going to give you the edge in life. That gifting is going to cause you to make a massive impact in your sphere of influence. But do you know that your gifting and calling will only flourish if you are in the house of God? Look at what David said here, Psalms 52. He said, I am like an olive tree thriving in the house of God. Look what he said in Psalms 92. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. This is the church. This is why the church is so important and why we need ministry leaders, because they help cultivate that calling. They help us to thrive. They help us to flourish in God's calling in our lives. If you're taking notes, write this down. Until you have submitted to authority, God will not give you the authority you need to fulfill your calling. You have to submit to authority to be trusted with authority. David served King Saul before he ever became a king. Okay, you and I, we're part of a kingdom that is much greater than ourselves. And you're going to have to know that you know that you know. Number one, you need to be a part of a local church. Number two, you need a ministry leader and pastor in your life. This has to be an unshakable revelation in your life and in your heart. And I want to end with this. Whatever, whatever you do, never fall into this trap, the trap of leaving church. I have seen people leave churches because of a fence, which many times was rooted in dishonor. And you know what? They never thrive. They never flourish in their callings. Why? Because they got disconnected from the well. They got disconnected from the family of God. And isolating believers, this is the goal of the enemy. Remember, remember, his goal is to tear down and to destroy the church. Have you ever noticed when a believer isolates themselves, they fall into temptation? Why? Because there's no accountability. This is exactly what the enemy wants. And when Christians abandon churches, not only do they lose their, protect, their protection of accountability, but this also weakens the structure and foundation of the local church they should be attending. See, the devil knows this all too well. And this is why we are instructed in Hebrews chapter 10, you should not stay away from the church meetings as some are doing, but you should meet together and encourage each other. Do this even more as you see the day coming. Another translation says, we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And it's apparent that this was a problem that started to happen in the early church. And um, that's why it was addressed here. But the Bible says, I love this, it says, do this even more. Gather even more as you see the day coming. You can see God's heart. For the church. You can see his heart. You know, like in Haggai chapter 1, verse 8, he says this He says, Rebuild my house, then I will take pleasure in it and be honored. He said this to people because they started to ne neglect the house of God to build their own homes. He said, Why does my house lie in ruins? He said, Get back to building my house and I'll be honored in it. You can see the heart in the early church leaders. Um, scripture shows us that they dove in with one focus, they dove in with one passion, they gave all their finances, they gave all their time, all their energy to build the house of God. You can see the heart for the church with Jesus. John chapter 2 said, passion for God's house consumed him. And I just pray that the same passion Jesus had for his church is the same passion you'll have, that it consumes you. And I want to encourage you, stay plugged into your church, stay faithful, and build God's house. I'll see you next session.